would you describe um, Happy Sad Man and what was your motivation to make it? Sure. So Happy Sad Man came to be through initially my relationship with a very good friend Johnny. So I say in the film he is at once the happiest and saddest man That's right. I've ever met. And John and I met when I was back in film school and I made a short documentary about him. And I was just really fascinated by his ability to express not just the joy in his life but also the sorrow. And he experiences very high highs and very low lows. So John and I became good friends and I always wanted to make a larger project with him. And then I thought about happiness and sadness and how our culture often um, doesn't encourage men to express their emotions in the same way that women might be or girls are. So I thought, well, why don't I explore happiness and sadness through the eyes of five different guys? And, um, and explore these themes. The film is quite a stereotype busting exercise, isn't it? You've deliberately gone out to challenge the notion that men are stoic. They're basically men are told culturally to suck it up. Yes. You know, you're having trouble at work, having trouble at home, you're having any sort of problem, are you feeling depressed or you're feeling sad, you're a man, suck it up, yes. shut up and get on with it. Mm. This film challenges that, doesn't it? Yeah, I very much wanted to challenge that um, stereotype of, of being told to man up or suck it up, as you say. I think that men don't benefit from, um, from that, but neither do women and children. So for me, um, the film can also bust stigmas around talking about mental health. I think, you know, in days gone by, it was very much encouraged to just, like, don't bother people with your problems with that sort of stuff. But people are realising now that, um, especially with the suicide statistics in our country, that um, we need to talk about this stuff. And so things are changing, and I think that's great, but there's a long way to go um, in how we're raising our kids um, and, and our boys in particular to, to feel comfortable expressing not just the good times, but the difficult times too. It really is tapping into a zeitgeist thing. It is, there is something in the ether now about, you know, it's okay yeah. to, to speak up. It's okay yeah. to be vulnerable yeah. and to show that you are a bit frail under, under the, the veneer of machismo or masculinity that yeah. you may have. Yeah. Um, I think the key character in your film that shows that is the gentleman in the outback. Johnny? John, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Ivan. Ivan, Ivan, yeah. Ivan. The guy who goes around yeah, yeah. and talks to all these people um, who uh, work properties. Yeah. And that seems to be the quintessentially Australian um, uh, 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 model of a man who's actually doing this wonderful work yeah. telling men to, to be open and to uh, express themselves. Yeah, Ivan does really amazing work in the farming communities with both men and women. And um, obviously working on the land has come with so many different challenges and is so weather dependent, as Ivan says. So he makes people comfortable, he goes around, has a cup of tea and chats with them about what might be going on in their life and really listens. And a big part about Happy Sad Man, um, what I've learned is the importance of listening to other people. Yeah. Sometimes people feel like they... Um, don't know how to help someone so they don't do anything at all. So another big motivation uh, for me making the film was to make something that helped me understand how to better be there for people like Johnny or other mates who are having a hard time. And I think audiences as well hopefully will watch Happy Sad Man and, and get a bit of insight into how they can better be there, not just for themselves but for other people. You do want the film to have a social impact, don't for you? For sure, yeah. Uh, but I take it you would not describe yourself as an activist filmmaker but you would describe yourself as a subjective documentarian. Is that fair? Yeah, I don't know what I describe myself as. Um, <laughs> I think that um, I'm really passionate about compassion and friendship and humanity and, and really um, holding space for those sometimes more difficult conversations. So I think learning how to do that has been really important to me. Because sometimes I think, you know, there's things on YouTube you can look up how to, you know, vegan cooking recipes or how to learn a language, but where do we go to learn how to just be with people? Mm. And that's something that, that's probably the underlying thesis for the whole film, really, was for me to learn, like, how can we be, be there for other people? So. Can you just describe your approach for me? Because you are subjective as opposed to being objective. Yeah. You put yourself in the story yeah. and you make it very, very clear. Yeah. Why that approach? Yeah, I think um, with Happy Sad Man and with other films I've made, I have such a close relationship to the people in my films, my participants, and so I'm not a fly on the wall sort of observing them from a distance. I'm actually having conversations with them um, in a way that's very organic and honest and there's a friendship there. So rather than trying to pretend that I'm just a journalist who's flown in for a day and chatting to someone and then leaving, that's not what I'm doing. So um, 
as a filmmaker, I used to not really like the idea of being in my films or having any narration. I was like, mm. but actually, um, feedback from audiences was that it was helping them to access the story in a way to understand who they were and how I knew them, and so I sort of went with that. Um, and yeah, I think that um, that's what makes this film different is that I do have a really close relationship with these guys, and the film is shot over a number of years as opposed to just maybe a day or two in their life. So I. Conscious though of the downside of being a subjective documentarian, in that you can find yourself so attached to your subjects that you could find yourself either ignoring certain aspects of the story or going soft on certain as aspects of the story that you need to go hard on. Are you aware of the downside of being subjective? Yeah, I think for me, um, a really big part of my process is always to do test screenings before the film's finished. So if you wait till it's finished and show audiences, a little bit late to take on any feedback so what I always do is, is do a number of um, rough cut screenings and fine cut screenings with some people in the industry and some editors but also some strangers who I don't know who don't work in film just regular hunters who might watch the film and really listen to how they're receiving the film and what's resonating and if there's any pet parts they didn't understand or that weren't working so that gives me plenty of time in the post-production process to take that into consideration so that's one way that I, um, I find is really helpful to to sort of step back a bit and yeah. Now, how many years did you spend making I Am Eleven? Um, I Am Eleven, including the editing process, was six years. And, and and Happy Sad Man? Well, actually, I probably didn't think it was going to take this long, but some of the early interviews in Happy Sad Man were um, from seven years ago, so seven year process. For okay, these are big chunks of time. How old are you? <laughs> I am 38 years old. Okay, well, these are big chunks of time to produce a film. All credit to you for your dedication Thank you. and your passion Thank you. and for just the, the beautiful honesty that come that breathes through Happy Sad Man. Oh, thank it's you. just such a beautiful, it's not just a conversation starter, but the film itself is a conversation. You can see the ideas just intertwining in the film itself and the final segment of the film is something beyond anything that you could plan. Yeah. Which is one of the beautiful things about documentary. Yeah. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. That's what I kind of love about making documentaries is that you're not, in, you're not in control in the same way that if you've written a script and you know what's going to happen in the start, middle and end with the documentary. In so many ways you have to be spontaneous and agile and respond to what's going on. And some things did go on that I never would have imagined were going to happen and I had to, um, had to really respond to that. Right. But having said all that, are you looking for projects that might not take as long to make or Genevieve are you happy to just to devote that amount of time yeah I think each film is its own kind of beast slash baby slash beast <laughs> and um, yeah my company is called Proud Mother Pictures because my films like my babies and you raise them and they have different gestation periods and so maybe my next film won't need to take more than a year maybe it will take five years it depends on the stories. And for me, I think you've got to be really patient making documentaries for so many reasons. Um, and I think one of them is because the story needs to get to where it needs to get to. And so, um, yeah, I didn't think Happy Sad Man would take this long, but I'm really proud of the film and all the guys in it. So I don't know. Um, how do you live? Yeah, so... How, um, do you, how do you make a living? Yeah, so when we made I'm 11, um, I was working two or three jobs at a time, saving up, buying a ticket to shoot overseas, coming back. Um, and Henrik, who produced the film with me, was doing the same. We were just putting all our own personal savings into it, which is why it took so long. Um, but with Happy Sad Man, we were really, really lucky to be selected for an initiative called Good Pitch, um, run by Shark Island Institute and Documentary Australia Foundation. So we were able to pitch the film at the Sydney Opera House to a room full of people who were interested in investing in social impact films, so documentaries that would have some sort of positive social impact. So we were one of six films that year um, to pitch, and people in the audience stood up and either offered financial support or backing or in-kind support. And we also had lots of cultural organisations and um, mental health related groups like SANE Australia, Black Dog Institute, the Rugby Union Players Association who all stood up and said, we want to see this film be made and we want to help get the word out. So, so, but, so how do you live day to day? How do you, when you're not making documentary films... Um, how do, you, how do you pay the bills? Yeah, so that's that's a really challenging part of what I do, which is um, having these long periods of working on a film and then releasing it, which is why there's a lot of um, 
pressure on, on making a budget that you do have, even if it's limited, last. And then over the years I've done different sorts of work, um, other directing work or editing work or teaching um, film schools. So I just do enough work to be able to pay the bills, but um, also allows me enough time to keep working on my, on my documentaries. Right. Your, yeah, your ideal model, I think, would be, though, to have a job that would pay enough for you to make your documentaries without having to seek finance elsewhere. My ideal job is doing my job, which is that I work full time making documentaries. So, yeah. Okay. Now, are you ready for the uh, Shrimpy Challenge? Yes. Okay, because here it comes. Okay. Um, because you obviously love working independently, mm -hmm. um, and you like taking a lot of time to develop and uh, evolve your stories, and you like to let the story tell itself, basically, mm -hmm. which is one of the beautiful things about these two first two films that you've made. Thank you. And it really does come through with Happy Sad Man. It is a really beautiful film. Thank and you. And I mean that. But here's the challenge for you, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a TV network executive. Mm -hmm. And I've seen your beautiful little films, love them. And I'm coming to you now and I'm going to say, Genevieve, I'd like to give you $2 million to make a film, a documentary for us, about Indigenous culture and how it's dying in the 21st century and we want it in 18 months mm -hmm. so we want you to go out with that brief and come back mm -hmm. with a documentary that tells that story and that's the message that we want that it's a film about the, 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 the death of the, the slow dying the slow death of indigenous culture what would you say to such an offer? Well the first thing I would say is that as a non-indigenous person um, I don't believe that I would be the best person to lead that project. We want you to make it. We, we understand those arguments but about cultural appropriation, all that stuff. Yeah. But you know what? We want you to make it. We want to give you two million bucks, 18 months to make the film. Obviously. Yeah, I think um, I have a, a number of friends who work in this space, Indigenous filmmaking and television, and we talk about the fact that um, it's there are so many important stories that should be shared, but um, who is the right person to tell that? So it may be that if um, I was involved in a capacity producing capacity with other um, Indigenous producers and there was an Indigenous director or if I was to participate with permission from community, um, from people who were happy to me be involved, I guess it would all be about having those conversations and making sure that um, the film was, yeah, was created in a way that was sensitive to everyone involved and obviously being a non-Indigenous person, um, questioning, you know, what the best contribution I could make to that would be. Okay, but we'd like you as the director, we'd like you to, to direct it. Um, yeah, we'll probably, probably have to talk to people um, in the community, Indigenous community, about, about that mm -hmm. before I could give you an answer, Jim. And you're happy, you're happy to, to go with the brief to actually show Indigenous cultures dying? You're happy to stick to that brief and make sure that that's the message that we want to deliver? Because we have markets out there in Europe and in America, they want to see this story. So, are you happy to stick to that story? Uh, I don't think it would be my call on what the, what the best story to tell is. Oh, this is our call. We're yeah, making the call yeah. for you to do that, tell that story. Yeah, it would need to be in consultation with Indigenous people. That would be my that first and last okay. response, yeah. Okay. You want a clause in the contract, don't you, that says, in case the story does not turn out the way you predicted. Because that can happen. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. What is the case? Do you have documentary filmmakers that have inspired you or who have influenced you? Yeah, I would say when it comes to um, films that have influenced or inspired me, they tend to be individual films more so than just one filmmaker. Okay. Um, but I, one filmmaker that comes to mind is a, a British documentarian called Kim Longinotto, who um, makes very observational based films. So um, she's made a film called Pink Sari, she made a film called Hold Me Tight, Let Me Go, which was um, went into a school in the UK with children with specific needs. Um, they're quite intense, the stories, but um, she's also got, a, I think, a really great way of respecting um, and empowering the people who are sharing their stories. doesn't feel exploitative at all. So for me, films where I feel like the people in them um, are respected and, mm -hmm. um, and that there's, you know, there's not too much heavy-handedness from the filmmaker, I'm also really passionate about music, so I tend to like documentaries where the music isn't too, you know, um, intrusive. And so Nick Huggins, who wrote the score for I'm Eleven and Happy Sad Man and some of my other films, he's a really um, big part of my collaborator. So I would say I'm equally as inspired by music as I am by film. Okay. Uh, final question. Um, Michael Apted, 
Are you yes. familiar with the Seven Up yes. series? I met him in December. How did that go? You met him when? Sorry, in, in Melbourne. You met him in Melbourne when? He was in December. He was out here. He did like a um, masterclass talk at RMIT, and he was um, shooting some footage for the latest episode of um, the Seven Up the series. Latest, yes, the latest. Yeah. So. How did um, you go? I grew up watching the Seven Up series. Seven, fourteen, twenty-one, twenty-eight. I used to quote it at the dinner table with my family, and it was a big um, influence, I think, in deciding to make I'm Eleven, which was studying an age. But I wanted to, rather than doing it just in Australia, I wanted to leave Australia for the first time and travel around the world. So the Seven Up series, often people say to me, "Have you seen that?" I said, "Yep, yeah, absolutely." So when he was out in Melbourne, I met him and gave him a copy of the film, and he had a look and he said, "Ah." Oh, you competition. I said, no, I'm not competition. There's enough room for everyone. Well, <laughs> you know why I brought that up. Why? Well, because the kids who were in I Am 11, Yeah. well, how old are they now? Well, the youngest is 20. Yeah. And um, the eldest is 25 this year. So I'm going to do a sequel. So following up and I've intermittently been doing shooting with them now that they're young adults. You, so. you, you answered my question. Because oh, I was going to ask you. Yeah. I am 30. Yeah. You, you can easily do a follow-up now, given yeah. so much time has elapsed. Yeah. And you are doing this. You are yeah. doing it. Yeah. So I've been documenting them, um, you know, some of them through their teenage years. Um, and obviously they're in 15 different countries, so it's quite a big project. But when audiences saw I'm 11, so many people would come out of the cinema and say, are you going to do a sequel? And I said, yeah. I mean, I love those kids. They're like my nieces and nephews, so I'm never going to get sick of... Of um, spending time with them. If, and if, yeah, if they're happy to be in it, then I'll, I'll film them. And also, the difference between 11 and in your 20s, yeah. that's a, like a lifetime. Yeah. So much changes. Yeah, for sure. So, so that's going to, that's you, you know, oh, that's a film that you, you've got on the plate. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Which I'm excited about. And I'm excited that when I'm 11 came out, a lot of 11 year olds came here to Cinema Nova and other cinemas to watch it, that now they'll be about 18, those kids. So they'll be hopefully coming along to see Happy Sad Man now. Now, with I Am 11, yeah. which was acclaimed across the world, you did heavy touring with that film, yeah. festivals, Q&As yeah. and so on, yeah. then it gets a cinema release. Yeah. I want to know how intrinsic the touring part of the life of the film is to you. Mm. The going to festivals and doing the Q&As and all that stuff. How important is that to you? Because you seem to do a lot of it yeah. and you seem to love it. Yeah, it's super important to me to see firsthand how audiences are engaging with the work. And I often say 50% of my job is making the film, and then 50% is making sure people see the film mm -hmm. and can access it. I feel like so many great films get made and they come and go and we hardly get to see them. Um, and so for me, travelling with the film not only is an opportunity for me to meet audiences, but often someone from one of my films will come with one of the participants and meet audiences. And I think more and more now people obviously can watch movies at home and there's so many streaming services so to make a bit more of an event of it mm. so when people come out and see a film they've actually pre-booked a ticket in the way that you would for a band if one of your favourite bands were coming you couldn't just turn up in the night mm. and go a hotel and expect to get in sometimes it's fully booked out So in your little way what you try to do is create an event around the film make it sort of an event film yeah. given the megatonnage of competition that small independent documentary filmmakers have now yeah. against the latest mega billion dollar comic book whatever yeah um it's quite a challenge for you to do but necessary yeah and um it's a really interesting experience because you get to hear firsthand from audiences after they've just seen the film often you know people can write comments online or social media which is great too but to see audiences as they're receiving the work um and then hear straight away what they thought about it that also helps inform my future decisions to make films in terms of what I might want to make a film about and what audiences, what aspects of my film audiences are really um, connecting with. Yes. Do you have to be a little bit insane to be an Australian filmmaker? Uh, well, I've just made a film called Happy Sad Man, so I'm very careful about using the word sane or insane, because as John in the film would say... Crazy. Do you have to be just a bit... Do you have to have a bit of the crazy in you to, to persist? Yeah, you have to be very persistent. My mum says I'm like a dog with a bone. And I used to think, what does that mean? And she said, when you get your mind on something, it doesn't matter if there's hurdles in the way, you'll jump over them. So I think you have to be pretty good at jumping hurdles, I would it's say that. Well, that's why the exhibition process is something I'm so passionate about. Because if my films are not seen by people, they don't really feel finished. So for me, when I'm 11 opened here at Cinema Nova, I was out handing flyers and putting posters up and that opening weekend was so nerve-wracking and I love sharing with other filmmakers 
how that felt because I came down to the box office. This is something I probably haven't said on camera before, but I've spoken about. I came down to the box office on the opening weekend and I asked one of the um, staff members how tickets were going and she said, well, we've got it on the computer so I can tell you exactly how they're selling. I said, oh, that'd be good. And it was July, but it was a sunny day. And I said to her, oh, what, well, the next session starts at one o'clock. She said, yeah, it's five to one now, so I'll tell you how many have sold. I said, please. And she said, uh, two. I said, two tickets. And she goes, yeah. So I went out in the street, kept handing out flyers, and I was like, rang my mum, and I thought, and she goes, it's, it's so sunny though, it's winter, but it's a nice day, everyone's gonna wanna be outside. And that whole weekend, I remember thinking, this is so important, opening weekend for any film, especially an Australian film, it's critical. And I came back in the evening, and I was talking to one of the night managers, and he said, congratulations on how the film went today, and I thought, he's just being nice. And I said, oh, how were the tickets? He said, oh, so good. And he said, we actually, you know, tally up at this time of night, it was 10 o'clock or whatever, how they've gone and we, we rank, you know, we've got 15 films per day, we rank them. And then he said, do you want me to tell you how it went? And I said, sure. And he said, number one, Time 11 was the number one for the box office. And I said, how is that possible? And he said, oh, you did, you know, did great. And I said, but what about the one o'clock session? And he said, that was in our biggest cinema, cinema one. And I said, yeah. And he goes, yep, sold out, fully sold out. And I said, but I came at five to one and they said that they'd sold two tickets. And he goes, no, there was only two tickets left at that point. Ah. <laughs> And the moral of that story is even when things are going well, you've got to keep working hard. Fantastic. So, yeah.